Oh, mate. Just waking up now to watch this Brentford game. In my bed. Four, just, just gone 4.45 here. So, uh, yeah, I've got the game on. So, uh, yeah, fingers crossed. Don't forget the results, so uh, yeah, stay tuned, peeps. Stay tuned. Wow, that was a edgy, edgy first half. I'm just about to uh, get ready to get to work, but that first half was edgy. Fulham having quite a few good chances. I mean, a great save by Raya. So uh, fingers crossed, we're still in the game, and uh, yeah, I'm on my way to work now. And then uh, I will see when I get to work. Uh, I'll catch a bit the rest of the end of the game, and then. Uh, yeah, hopefully it's there for us. I think it's there. Just got to work now. So I've got a little session with my year seven boys, but uh, I think I'm gonna have my mobile on and have it on in the background on the KO and uh, hopefully see what happens in this extra time. Fingers crossed we can uh, get this win, mate. So I'll tell you, nail biting stuff, nail biting stuff. But fingers crossed, fingers crossed. Joe Bryan! He's caught out David Raya! Oh my god. I can't believe what I just saw. I mean, would you say it's an unbelievable free kick or bad goalkeeping? Oh my days. I just hope now, second half, we can get back into this game. Crazy, crazy. History repeats for Fulham. Sad, sad times. It looks like my beloved Brentford haven't done it, but at the end of the day, you've got to say, proud of them. They've done the best they can do, but it just wasn't meant to be. Well done to Fulham, all the best. And uh, that's life. That's life. Yeah, poor old Roy Dawusu, the Brentford legend, getting up at 4am to watch the Bees lose out in that playoff final. Hello, I'm Ben Turner, and this is the final official EFL podcast of what has been an unprecedented, unpredictable and sensational season. We'll be speaking to a Fulham legend in Bobby Zamora, and we'll also be catching up with the EFL's newest team. But first, here's a reminder of a dramatic night at Wembley. Kenny sliding the ball through and picking out Josh Onaman, a sharp save from David Raya, who then had to block the follow-up, but he didn't know too much about it. He knew plenty about the first save. Over Reed reading camera in the box is dropped to Bobby D called over Reed and the chance gone they should really deal with this Brentford they don't it's not an easy chance for Dick over Reed Dalsgaard has done well getting round on the cover getting goal side of the striker it's on the half volley he's, he's leaning back leaning away from the ball Ollie Watkins in space here it's Watkins and Rodak is called into action oh, for Ollie Watkins that's the first real sight of the Fulham goal We are going the distance in the championship playoff final at Wembley. Goalless after 90 minutes. Emiliano. Sergi Canas looking to make things happen. Ollie Watkins. A big sight of goal for the Brentford striker. It's a goal kick. He wants more. Final few seconds of the first period of extra time. Still. Goalless at Wembley. Fulham looking to change the picture here. Joe Bryan eyeing this up. Joe Bryan! He's caught out David Raya! Inventive, bright thinking! It could send Fulham to the Premier League! One swing of a boot to possibly become a mortal at Craven Cottage. This is Caballero. Tom Kearney. Bryan again on the charge. It's Joe Bryan again! It's incredible! The fullback is moonlighting as a striker! Wembley is his! Fulham have been down this road before and they are feeling right at home at World Football Stately Home!
Saeed Ben Rama. Clubs will be calling and knocking on Brentford's door for his services. We've got trying to rise, and maybe there is a little bit of hope. It's Henrik Dalsgaard. Is hope reignited? Time's ticking away. History repeats for Fulham. This is how they got to the Premier League two years ago. And they have hit the heights on the greatest stage again. The doors to the Premier League Kingdom open up again. English football royalty is waiting to welcome Fulham back. Just starting to believe a little bit. Well, Hoylet's got the better of Buxton. Puts it into an area. Keo, Zamora! Unbelievable! Now, who else better to speak to than a man who knows all about scoring the winning goal in a playoff final? That man is former Fulham striker Bobby Zamora. Bobby, how will Joe Bryan be feeling after that? I'm guessing a little hungover this morning. Yeah, and undoubtedly he'll be a, a little hungover. I think you'll be slightly surprised as well that he's uh, not only come up with one one goal, but two in the final. Um, and uh, yeah, absolutely buzzing for him. Absolutely buzzing, buzzing for the club as well. So um, over the moon, but what an occasion. And uh, yeah, I think he'll still wake up this morning, banging head um, and pinching himself. Yeah, you've scored the winner twice in a playoff final, um, as we've touched on. Is there a better feeling in football? I'm guessing it's right up there for you. Yeah, I mean, it's one, it's a huge occasion. Um, unfortunately for him um, and the club, obviously the fans, your friends, your family um, wouldn't have been there. But for myself and obviously majority of, of, of big finals that, that people go to and are successful in, it's a fantastic occasion, first and foremost, for, you, for your friends and your family that go along for the, uh, to the game. Um, and obviously there's, the, there's the, the joy for all of the fans and the club, um, the relief as well. Um, you know, you, you work all season for for one game um, and it's come down to that is uh, is heartbreaking if you lose but uh, what an occasion no better way to get promotion than in a playoff final Yeah for you when you did score those goals for West Ham and, and QPR did, did you wake up and have a feeling that it was going to be your day that day or, or did it just work out for you? Um, I just remember being completely relaxed uh, both games really um, I actually done a, a playoff diary really for for uh, some friends and uh, I just remember walking around the canteen in the morning and um, day of the game just being so totally relaxed and having a laugh and a joke and ripping some of the other players um, so being completely re relaxed um, and just trying to take in the, the occasion trying to enjoy it but it does go so fast um, and it is all a little bit of a blur but but nice to to look back on you know video footage and you know clubs generally now do do that anyway and have a lot of cameras everywhere in this day and age there are cameras everywhere recording everything so um on a successful day like um it, like the playoff final yeah you know that i'm sure the club will put something together and you'll be able to look back and take it all in but um generally i'm normally quite relaxed for for big games um and just try and relax and enjoy it and what will be will be uh, a, a lot of my thinking is how much do you enjoy though being a part of those clubs' histories, West Ham's history and, and QPR's history? Because like you mentioned, obviously, it gets brought up every year around, well, not this time of year usually because it's a bit of an unusual yeah. season, but it gets brought up in May every year. You get repeats of, and see those goals again. Mm. Yeah, it's nice. And it's nice that it means so much to so many fans, you know, and throughout the year, whenever you bump into any, QPR or West Ham fans, they always bring it up, obviously, and, and how much it means to them. And it's, it's nice to be a, be part of um, the club's history um, and so, so many people's fond memories. You say you're relaxed as well, but you've experienced the pressure of being you know, one of the favourites for promotion in the Championship with, with both QPR and uh, West Ham. Um, how much credit has to go to, to Scott Parker for, for delivering when the pressure is on like that? Because a lot of people were expecting Fulham to go straight back up. Um, yeah, a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure. Um, but I think he's worked a tremendous job, really. I, I think he's done very, very well in terms of the recruitment, the players that he's had. He's not gone and spent mad, mad money. Um, but he's worked with a bunch of players, um, moulding them, um, grown them, and certainly grown his philosophy in, in the club as well. So I'm really pleased for him. 
extremely pleased that there's another English manager in, in the Premier League next season. Undoubtedly, it's going to be very, very hard for him um, and the club, but uh, it's certainly where they want to be and the platform that the, uh, where they want to be as well. How much were you impressed with his tactics as well last night? Obviously, it was a bit of a surprise not to see Mitrovic starting the game. Obviously, we found out afterwards he was carrying that injury, but they did nullify Brentford's threat very well, didn't they? Yeah, they've done extremely well. They worked very, very hard. Um, I don't think Brentford created much at all, really. I was expecting them to, to, to be a lot more um, a lot more of a threat. But that, like you say, comes down to, to the tactics that Scott's employed. Um, and, and like you say, yeah, a surprise that Mitrovic wasn't playing. But for myself, I would have done the same thing and not brought him on um, until the end. One, to either relieve um, the pressure or, or, you know, if they're after a goal to be that big threat in the box. Um, obviously, we don't know the extent of the injury, but it must have been, must have been quite bad. I mean, I, know, I remember seeing him warming up, bib off, bib back on, you know, was he going to go on? And I think they were weighing up when the extra time was going to come and uh, how much, how long he could play. But so tactically, very good from Scott um, and so pleased for him. How frustrating will it have been from Alexander Mitrovic's part, though, not to be able to, even though he is injured, obviously, but not to be, you know, be able to play as much of a part as he, he'd wanted in that final? Because you were telling me before we started the interview about your experience in the Europa League final. Can you just t- tell us about that? Yeah, I obviously missed the Europa League final. Uh, well, I played, but I probably shouldn't have done. Um, I had an Achilles injury, but it, obviously playing all season, like Mitrovic has done this year, contributed to the run. Um, and and it coming down to such a big occasion um, and, and such you know one final game, I'm sure he would have been disappointed. But equally, he would have been pleased to to get on the pitch and actually be a part of that game, be a part of that club's history. Um, didn't score, but again, like I say, to be a part of it, be out on that pitch and do his job and come through the game, um, not injured again as such. So yeah, I think he'll be pleased. A few weeks to recover, get that treatment. Uh, and look forward to the to the Premier League. Yeah, no regrets now. Of course, he is in the Premier League, as, mm-hmm. as you mentioned. But um, now, Fulham in the Premier League is it is it fair to say they need a different approach this time than, than the last time out if they are to, to stay in there and stay up this season, next season, should I say? Uh, they're going to uh, recruitment always comes down. You know, it's so important. Um, it's going to be interesting to see who they go for, what sort of money they're looking to spend. Um, but recruitment's key and, and whether it goes down to a sporting director or Scott has a, a full say on who he wants. I personally believe that, that, that the manager should have um, complete say on who comes in and who goes out. Um, so it'll be interesting, but Scott's, a, Scott's an experienced guy. You know, he, he, he hasn't had many years in management, but he knows the game. He knows the game very, very well. So um, I'm hoping that it, he has his say. Uh, he brings in who he wants. And uh, he certainly gives it a good crack. Of course, you've experienced struggles in the Premier League. You've, you've fought to stay up in, in your time as a player. What What is the secret when you are you know, going up against all the odds to, to stay in the Premier League? What's the secret in, in terms of trying to, to mount that, that challenge yeah. for, for safety? Yeah, for me, it's the changing room and making sure that all of the players are together. Um, the, the, the year... Um, that QPR struggled. There was there was there was splits in the in the in the changing room, um, and and that's ultimately ultimately what what caused our our downfall. I think um, so. Having that that change room um, all together uh, and fighting for each other is key. And it's hard when when you're down there, um, but it's having the right characters, the right leaders in that changing room. So uh, I'm, I'm and Scotty was one of those. You know, Scotty himself when he played was one of those leaders in the changing room. Um, and uh, I'm sure he'll be looking for looking at one or two players to certainly step up and bring a few in as well. Well, Bobby, I know it's your wife's birthday today, so we'll leave it there. Thanks very much for your time. You're welcome. So we can't do a pod looking back at the playoff final without Joby McEnough, who, who joins us in between a double pre-season training session from Leighton Orient's training ground. Some commitment, that Joby. Uh, how impressed... Were you with Fulham's game plan last night, though? It worked a treat for Scott Parker, didn't it? Yeah, I thought they came out and they set up um, perfectly, really, to sort of thwart that, certainly that front three, but even the midfield areas that Brentford like to get on the ball and, and play. Um, Tom Kearney just dropped in a little bit deeper beside Harrison Reed, 
they looked quite flexible as well with and without the ball. So sometimes they're almost a 4-4-2 um, and then sometimes they were sort of a 4-2-3-1. The, the wide men were really narrow and obviously Josh Donimo was the one that was either up or just off um, the, the striker. So, you know, from, from that point of view, I think game plan wise, they, they controlled the game. They, they really nullified any threat um, that Brentford were going to pose. And I've got to be honest, I thought they were very, very comfortable um, and, and very, very worthy winners in the end. Yeah, I know you predicted it to be tight as well, but certainly it was very, very tense, as you mentioned. Is that part of an occasion like that now? Because the, the game meant so much to, to both teams. Yeah, I think when you look at playoff finals, generally they are tight affairs. Obviously, we've had some classics down there, down the years. Um, but generally, I think with so much at stake, and again, you know, we can't forget, you know, the effort that these boys have put in, um, you know, the amount of games they've had in such a short period of time, um, you know, to, to get to a final and be at the end of such a, a condensed fixture list. I'm sure that took a little bit of a toll. Again, add on the pressure. And you, you sometimes get, you know, maybe less of a spectacle, but, you know, it's a game that was obviously full of tension. And, um, you know, from, from that point of view, it, it's to be expected a little bit. I think that the neutrals would expect two good teams that are going to come and, and get the ball down and, and play attacking football. But again, credit to Scott Parker. He never allowed Brentford to get in their stride and, and do what they wanted to do. So, um, you know, that's a big part. If you, if you let Brentford play and do what they want, you know, they're, they're a tough, tough task for anybody to deal with. So, you know, I think that went into the planning, certainly for, for Scott Parker. How impressed were you as well with, with Tom Kearney as well? A different type of performance from him than, than two years ago when he, when he scored that winner at Wembley. Looked a real leader on that pitch, didn't he? He did. And I think he's coming for a bit of unfair criticism um, this season. Again, I think he's almost a victim of the last successful Fulham team's success. I think Scott Parker is as well, although he had nothing to do with it. I think everybody compares this team to that team and they were two different teams. You know, I think Scott Parker realised halfway through the season that they've got to be a little bit more careful with how they play out. Um, and I think a lot of people look at Kearney as, well, he hasn't produced what he did during that season, but his role has been different when you look at how Fulham play. I mean, last night he was a lot deeper. He was really alongside Harrison Reed. But generally, he's been a bit deeper this season. So he's not getting in as many areas, forward areas, that he was certainly in that promotion year previously. Um, and again, listen, you want your big players to step up. Um, you know, he certainly did that last night with a real commanding performance in a real crucial area of the pitch. So, you know, I'm sure he would have been delighted. Scott Parker has really stuck by him. You know, he, again, he's, he's faced calls at times to, to maybe not even play. Um, but he's really stuck by Tom Kearney and he's come through from yesterday with a fantastic captain's performance that you know has gone a long way to, to helping him get into the Premier League. Speaking of big performances, your friend Michael Hector nullified Watkins throughout as well. How impressed were you with with how Virgil Van Mike played in this one? Yeah, I spoke to him about that nickname. To be fair, and he wasn't even really having it because he doesn't want to compare himself to Van Dyke, but. To his credit, you know, when you talk about impact, you talk about players coming in and, you know, being a real big difference in that team. He certainly had a massive impact in that team. And it's interesting, if he'd been available from the start of the season, you know, how close it was to Fulham actually going up automatically, that could have been the difference. You know, having said that, he wasn't available. He came in, obviously, played from January and they've had a very, very good record since. You know, I think he's been a real physical, constant presence in the heart of that defence. I think decision-wise on the ball, as much as he's comfortable, he doesn't take risks when they're not on. I think that's been a big part of Fulham conceding less goals than they were early on in the season. Um, and again, you know, to deal with Ollie Watkins, as he did last night, you know, you look at the goals he scores, but not just that. Ollie Watkins' movement is fantastic, probably as good as anyone in the division in that area of the pitch. And, you know, Michael Hector really had a big job on his hands last night and I felt that he really rised to the challenge. I think this is a good opportunity to find a home. You know, he's bounced around a lot in terms of going on loan, you know, even in his early part of his career when he was at Reading. And then when he moved to Chelsea again, you know, went over to Germany, 
been to Sheffield Wednesday, been to Hull, and he's seen this as an opportunity to really put down some roots and get himself established at a team that he can really go and kick on at. And, you know, I think, again, you talk about big performances, you talk about big players, and he certainly delivered that last night. Yeah, certainly made some impact. Um, I've talked about this with you for some time as, as well in terms of um, Scott Parker, as you've mentioned, you, you've talked about him at the beginning of the podcast, but um, to turn that losing mentality of last season around is something really special as well that I want to get onto. Just how good a job has he done? Because it's not all been plain sailing for this, for him this season, has it? No, he hasn't. And again, you know, I've touched on it earlier, but I, I think he's done a fantastic job. You know, it, Everyone would say, look at the squad. You know, they were a Premier League team. But again, like you said, they lost a lot of football matches last year, particularly towards the end of the season. There'd be players in that dressing room that, quite frankly, wouldn't want to be there. They don't want to play in the Championship. They would have been looking at a Premier League team, thinking this is where I should be. So that, just as a, a start, is a difficult thing to turn around the mentality of the players and the fact that they were losing games. So, you know, for him to come in and and really changed that. And for me, it it took, you know, four or five months of the season for the players to kind of get it, you know, understand what the level requires in terms of just winning games. I think they had a mentality of, well, we'll go out and and be the best team and pass the ball about and we'll win games. So that's that's not how it is in a championship. And I think it took them up until the new year to kind of really register that and understand it and be okay with it. They're not always going to, be beautiful on the eye and play fantastic football. They're going to have to just dog some games out sometimes and, and get some points. And they certainly did that in the second half of the season. And that is very much a trait of Scott Parker as a player. And speaking to him, it's something that he's really tried to instill in that group of players this season. And I think that was his biggest satisfaction, having spoken to him after the two semi-final games. You know, the first game was Fulham as we want to see Fulham, dominate the ball, completely one-sided and and really did a good job. Second game, not so good on the ball, but they came through it. And again, last night, I think it was a mixture of both. They had some good patches, some good play, but when they had to defend, when they had to see Brentford off, they did it. And I think that will be the most pleasing aspect of the night and the season in the end for Scott Parker. And again, you know, we talk about young English, British managers being given opportunities. And listen, it's a great job, you know, for your first role, Fulham, but there's pressure with that. He's had to deal with that pressure from the start of the season right up until the last kick last night. And you could see that in him after the final whistle, that real kind of relief. He, he looked drained, you know, and I'm just really happy for him that he's managed to get the team up because it's no mean feat. You know, not a lot of teams come down and go straight back up the next year. So he's done a fantastic job. Really pleased for him, you know, and, and everyone else at, at, at Fulham. Um, you know, very, very well, well deserved over the season. You mentioned in terms of the drain on Scott Parker, but there will be a drain on these Brentford players now as well. The squad will be hurting after losing a playoff final. You know all about that personally as well. Um, just how much do, do the squad now have to, to get together and, and sort of use that um, into go, going into next season? It's going to be difficult, I'll be honest. It's, it's, it's hard at... Um normal times, normal schedules, but the fact they're going to have such a short turnaround now, um, you know, it is something that you can very much carry on into the next season. And that's normally with a, a much longer break where you've got a little bit longer to process things. But, you know, we, we all know it's going to be a couple of weeks and they're going to be back at it. They're still going to have that loss with them, that feeling of disappointment. Again, we've seen some key players there that may be leaving, particularly now, you know, that they haven't quite made it to the Premier League. So, again, how are they going to deal with that? Um, but, listen, they're going to have to take a huge amount of positive uh, feelings forward. You know, they've had a brilliant season. And I think that's the biggest thing you take when the dust settles and the disappointment starts to subside. You look at it and you think, hang on, we had a very, very good season. We were one of the best teams. And there's no reason why, with a couple of little adjustments, we can't go and do it again. And that's when you start using those disappointments that, you know, it's a bit of anger, you know, it's frustration. You know, you'll see the fixtures come out. I'm sure they'll be looking at Fulham, who are Fulham playing on the first day or when Fulham have got the big games against, you know, the Uniteds and the Cities and Liverpools. And 
you're looking at those fixtures thinking, oh, that could have been us, you know. And again, that takes a little while to get over. So I think Thomas Frank, the biggest job he's got is, is not having that hangover, if possible, and trying to get off to a decent start next season. But again, looking back over this year, there's a lot to be proud of. You know, they were fantastic, great on the ice, scored lots of goals. Um, and I think, again, everyone at that football club, with the way that it's run, you know, deserves massive, massive credit for the season they've had. And I still think they're in a good position to, to push on in the future. You touched on the hangover though of, of this um, defeat, but also, as you mentioned, maybe one of the issues for Brentford going forward could be the, the model that they have as well. In, in terms of, you look at how Ben Rama and Watkins have played this season and, and Buemo, surely there's going to be a lot of interest going for those players now. People are going to want those players in the Premier League, aren't they? Well, they are. They're going to be targets. And again, with the model that Brentford have adopted, you'd have to imagine they're going to sell one or two because that's what they do. You know, what they have done in the past has gone out and replaced the seemingly irreplaceable with as good, if not better. You know, and I'm sure that's where the scouting departments now, um, you know, are in overdrive just in case they do get that big offer for a Ben Rama, for an Oli Watkins and Buemo. Uh, Rico Henry, I think, has had a fantastic season as well at left back. And I'm sure there'll be clubs interested in those players. So, um, you know, I think there will be departures. I think most Brentford fans will have to accept that. But I'd have confidence in the replacements coming in. Of course, you don't want to lose your best players. I know that. But they have a great track record of replacing those guys. And I think they do trust the process. And hopefully, if they can limit the departures, then you know, they'll still be in a good position next year to go mount an hour attack on, on trying to get promoted. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see who does come in if those players are sold. I reckon that a lot of clubs will be keeping an eye on who Brentford are interested in. Um, but let's end on Fulham, though. What, what do they need to do now to stay up such a short time until the season starts again, as you've mentioned? Yeah, I had a lot of sympathy with, with Scott last night. They, you know, he's being asked questions about can you switch off? Can you unwind after such a grueling season? And, you know, he said he wants a few days off. But again, with the way that things are, you know, you've got to really be proactive, you know, whether it's recruitment, whether it's organising pre-season, you know, that starts today. You know, they would have enjoyed last night, I'm sure. He would have woke up really happy this morning. But it is relentless. You know, it is now, right, what's next? And for me, they do need to improve the squad. Um, I think certainly... You know, I look at probably at the back, um, you know, in terms of going up to, to Premier League level again, as much as they want to keep the ball, they're not going to have as much possession as they did in the Championship as they will do in the Premier League. So they will be under a little bit more pressure defensively than maybe they have been at times this year. So I think that defensive area is going to be really, really important for them. Um, and for me, again, just adding that Premier League experience, that's one thing when we went up with Reading, you know, with the greatest respect to to lads we signed, you know, either before the season or, or during the season. We didn't quite have players come in with that real pedigree that the ones that potentially haven't got a lot of experience up there look around and see, listen, we've got him in there. He's going to be a 7, 8 out of 10 every week because he's been there and done it. And again, that then lifts the level of the rest of the squad. So I think that would be a, a key thing. Listen, it's a very attractive football club to be at, you know, in terms of its location, its history. So I don't think they'll have an issue recruiting players. I think it's just very important that they go and get some real, real key ones that go and enhance the squad um, to give them a fighting chance of, of staying up. I don't think they'll go down the model that they went down previously and go and spend a hundred odd million quid on a load of players. Again, for me, that's not really the right approach. I mean, Villa did it and have got away with it, I suppose, to a certain extent, but you can really count two, three of those players that have really gone on and had a massive impact. So I'd be looking at, you know, really those key three, four individuals to come in, strengthen the squad um, and give the lads an opportunity that have obviously got you there as well. Because there is some undoubted quality in that squad that I think can go up and, and do well. But again, it's a quick turnaround. Planning starts now and I'm sure they will want to give themselves the best chance of, of staying up next year. As you mentioned, not long until the season starts again for Fulham and for Joby McEnough as well. Uh, thanks for your time and enjoy the rest of the training. Nice one. Cheers, mate.
Well, from a team now leaving the EFL to a team joining it for the very first time, I'm delighted to say. Harrogate Town manager Simon Weaver and club captain Josh Falkingham now join me. Congrats to you both. Um, we'll start with you, Simon. Has what you've achieved sunk in yet? Because it's such an achievement for this football club. I think it's just just starting to... Um, it's a culmination of everyone involved, really. Um, certainly don't look at myself in the mirror and think I'm a better person than last week just because, you know, we won the promotion. But uh, we're all buzzing right now. And it's been an immense last couple of weeks from winning the semi- semi-final and beating Notts County in the final. Um, and... Uh, yeah, justifiably having a few drinks as well, so yeah, just to keep it going. It's such a journey for you as well, Josh. After starting at Leeds Academy all those years ago, can you believe that you're now finally playing in the EFL after all those years? Yeah, like for me, um, my little story, my journey, my career, where it's gone, I've, um, it seems a long time ago, but I spent a lot, a lot of years as a young kid from eight years old till 19 years old at Leeds United Academy. Do you know what I mean? It was my life and it were a huge part of it. Um, and it has been, and it's, it's allowed me to, you know, it allowed me to develop and um, become the kind of person and, and learn the, the things that I needed to learn at that age. Um, it didn't work out. Unfortunate. The dream was obviously for myself to be playing for Leeds United. Um, and at the time when I was at the club, um, there was in the football league. There was in League One. Um, but football is a ruthless business. I learnt that again at, at, at very the start of my career, and, and my journey led up to Scotland. I had a few five or six great years there, and then once I come back home, um, and, and, and obviously Gaffer, I had a, a year at Darlington, just finding my feet again back home. Um, Gaffer sports me. We sat down and, and, and listened to what Harrogate was was planning on doing, and the the aspirations of the club and where they want to go and it really fit exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to go back full time, which were the first kind of tick box. And then in them kind of first conversations that me and the gaffer had, it were like, like this we can we can do something special. And we both spoke about the football league being being the actual ultimate goal and, and, and we managed to get promotion in his first year, which was fantastic into the National League. But when you're on that kind of momentum and, and, and you're on that role in football it's a special kind of feeling and luckily we managed to achieve that on, on, on Sunday and a fantastic a fantastic day out which made it even better by getting the, the right result and achieving foot promotion to the Football League where there's all footballers that's where you want to be playing. Yeah, as you say, an incredible achievement. Uh, Simon, can can you believe that you're in this position, especially after such a, a long and uncertain campaign with everything that's that's gone on during lockdown? Um, yes, that's one of the things that's got to sink in, really, because uh, we we uh, sank to uh, new depths at times of despair, uh, not knowing. You know, we were involved with the decision making process, trying to trying to find out how the season would be concluded, but um, we came back in into our our hands you know and we could do something about it uh, by having the playoffs to play and fortunately it didn't get curtailed and it was null and void because that was muted at one point and that was a bit of desperation in the air from our point of view you know and I'm relaying it to the skipper today and you know and then obviously he has to relate to the rest of the players and there are scenarios where you're thinking oh my word I've got nothing positive to say and I'm the manager um but fortunately, you know, we've, we've had the playoffs and, and now we're in the Football League. Yeah, yeah as well, Josh, how have you and, and the players coped with, with that uncertainty, as we've talked about, off the pitch? You know, such a, as we said, such a difficult time for, for everyone. Yeah, it's, during that time, it was, I'm, you know, no denying it was tough as players um, and myself and the, the conversation that Gaff has just mentioned. Um, and it was more, more mentally tough do you know what I mean? Like for us to kind of get his heads round exactly conversations that I was having, then having a relay, like stage where it was just constantly changing every single day. So every time I woke up from the conversation that I would have got for the night before to then the next morning, it's completely literally gone from one spectrum to the to the up to the total opposite. So, you know, then lads come into me saying, Folks, what's going on? And I'm like, Well, I can you know, I'm only telling you what I've kind of heard and I think it got to a stage after about six or seven, five or six weeks or what, I can't remember exactly. And I kind of switched myself off because mentally it was just kind of, it was just draining and 
we kind of both said, me and the gaffer, when like, we'll speak when there's actual concrete, you know, conversations and, and, and facts coming out. And it sounds crazy, but even the national, like, it were only probably 24 hours before <laughs> the actual decision got made. Do you know what I mean? Of playoffs was happening. We still we sat there. Gaffer invited us all the club and the players in an actual Zoom call when he'd actually fully had the confirmation. And even at that time, as players, lads was asking me, you know, what's that group that we've all got? I'm getting promotion, folks. Is he say? Is he say? And we're all kind of sat there hoping that the gaffer's going to say that we was going to achieve promotion automatically. Then we get onto a Zoom call and it, it, it's back to playoffs. Do you know what I mean? But once we got our heads around that, we knew exactly we had clarification and we was able to just kind of focus his minds. We was delighted that we'd still got the opportunity, and we all knew at that moment two games away from the football league. So. We, we were able to get some good, hard training set, you know, like a good couple of weeks of pre-season, really, if you like, getting it in his legs, putting the hard work in and all boiled down to two, two games in which we managed to come through with flying colours. And, and, and I think everybody can and say that watching that we, we, we really deserved. As you say, such an opportunity, and you, and you took the opportunity. Uh, Simon, if I told you 11 years ago when you, when you took over, you'd be taking... You know, taking on teams, these teams that we're going to talk about in a minute on a regular basis, the likes of Bradford, the likes of Oldham, the likes of Bolton. Um, would you believe me? No, <laughs> it was uh, it was pretty desperate state of affairs at the club at the time. Um, no players, no atmosphere, very few people going through into the ground. Um, just anything about about the club, what everything about the club wasn't in place um so it's it was never going to be a quick fix uh, but i think hunger and desire has uh, has led us to this point you know where the last few years is just accelerated through the gears because of the they say it's a combination of a lot of people not just one person two people you know and it's a real team effort and the chemistry has been there and you can feel the chemistry, and it's a bizarre thing, but you can feel it equally in changing rooms I've been in, uh, where I think it's not going to happen here. It's just not there. But the last few years, you can just feel us getting better and stronger as a group, and and um, that's which was why it was quite hard to take in, in lockdown because we were all of the same belief. I think without being arrogant, we thought this could this, this is our year. You know, the feeling so strong. Um, so when we got the opportunity to play playoffs, we thought, now we have to just see it through. And you've taken quite a title though, as well now in the EFL, the longest serving manager in the top four divisions, taking over from, <laughs> from Gareth Ainsworth. How proud does that achievement make you feel? As obviously, it's such a tough achievement to, to have in, in the modern game. You don't see managers lasting a season nowadays. Well, it makes me sound like as if I'm going to be really old. So that's why I was dancing in the aisles at, uh, in the on the bus, you know, just to prove I wasn't just, uh, you know, in the 70s or something. But, no, um, yeah, I'm, well, it, I'm proud of that. You know, it's uh, it's been a long haul, but hopefully just because the steps, it's justified my position, you know, steps made, that it's justified my position in spite of family involvement that, you know, that we've progressed to the club. Yeah, Josh, I'm guessing that's of benefit to the players as well, working with someone for such an amount of time that you know you're going to have that continuity. Yeah, definitely. I think um, it's funny that you say that. I, I think with the gaffer and things like that, it, it doesn't really ever get mentioned, which it, the club deserve a lot of credit because as a player and uncertain times, I'm talking about this that we've just had. We, we, we started slowly. You know, we was we was like dipped to be right up there. We were slow. We had, you know, never at any stage in the change room as players, we knew that obviously there was security at the club. We saw other big clubs like Wrexham and, and Fylde, do you know what I mean? That were round about as last year at the top of the league. And they was like very much very similar. Both clubs, Fylde have obviously been relegated this season. They changed the manager. Wrexham changed the manager and, and, and luckily managed to get out of it and kind of stayed bottom half which nobody ever thought that they was going to be down that, that end of the table whereas the, uh, even after the slow, slow start there was no conversations regarding that there was no press there was no you know in the group and with that security and, and that continuity that we we built we knew that as long as we stick to his roles stick to his responsibilities we all know as players not just myself as captain but you know 
everybody in their positions to play play a huge part and we have done all season and it's 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 it, it, the club and, and, and the gaffer and, and, and the chairman and everything deserve a lot of credit for that and it just goes to show which when you do have that continuity it breeds success and look where we are now do you know what I mean after after a real slow start we picked up some good results went on a fantastic run and then all of a sudden we just continued that and and managed to finish second like the gaffer mentioned in the lockdown period there were we were a bit like not being arrogant and get, we, we honestly believed as a group we was going to catch Barrow and I know people it's saying it's okay saying that but that was the that was the belief but once we actually got playoffs it's a powerful thing what can happen when you actually believe it, it's going to happen and yeah the two games uh, um, and, and the promotion it's just been a fantastic achievement and one that we, we're all really really proud of. As I touched on as well, Josh, the, the, the achievement itself means you, you face the likes of the teams I've mentioned, the likes of Bradford, the likes of, of Bolton Wanderers. Um, who are you looking forward to facing the most? I think, uh, obviously, the one everybody will be talking about is Bolton. Um, a huge, huge club, which, you know, being in the top leagues with under Sam Allardyce not so long ago, do you know what I mean? And um, some amazing players, and it's just really been unfortunate what's happened there and, and they found themselves in League Two and, and we've managed to get promotion. So a lot of people will talk about that. But probably for myself, the local one, I'm a Leeds lad. Um, I've played a, a fair few reserve games at Bradford City growing up for Leeds. So I think that one for me probably stands out a little bit more. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing stadium, is Bradford, with a, with a huge team and the amount of crowds and the support that they get there. And it's a real... You know, a real good place to play football. The pitch, whenever I played there, and I'm sure it will be the exact same last year, is a fantastic surface. And um, hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed that we can have some fans um, back in them kind of stadiums and it'll, it'll make it even a better day out for, for us all. But yeah, probably for myself, being from Leeds, um, the Bradford City one is the one that I'm kind of looking at and really looking forward to. Josh mentions the pitch, um, Simon, at Bradford City, but not an ideal situation for you with, with the plastic pitch having to be ripped up and replaced um, going into the season. Doncaster, a good alternative for you, though, for the time being? Yeah, I think so. It's a, it's a really good stadium, isn't it, to play in, and a good playing surface as well, which should suit us. Uh, not too far away. It's not ideal for, for us or any of the supporters, but we've got thankful that we've got friends there and they're helping us out. Of course, it's not long until the season starts either, Simon. Um, how long are the players allowed off now as well? Or, or is it more or less straight back into training for them? No, there's got to be some kind of closure and um, enjoyment to be had by everyone. You know, this week and uh, next week uh, will also be off. So it's two weeks and we're, we're back in on the 16th, 17th. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I, I don't expect that. Listen, they didn't lose much fitness over lockdown. It's based not on continual report to the players. It was just on on trust, and that's what we've got. You know, we've got a bunch of hungry animals, and to, to fault there, he got released from Leeds, and I got released from Sheffield Wednesday at twenty. And there's a lot of different stories, and underneath it, there's real resilience to most of the individuals of all of us you know, that have got that little point to prove and it stays with you that and you either go under or, or you go right pick yourselves up and unfortunately we've got a really close knit group of individuals who who've got personality that shows right okay wherever we go we're going to make a game of it and uh, we will we will run through brick, brick walls and and I think part of that hopefully is that the trust and um, and like I say the fitness from to coming in was just it amazed us yeah, as coaching staff. So that's why we've been two weeks off now. Yeah, sounds like you've got a lot of trust and a lot of hunger in that squad as well. But for you, Josh, as well, could that be a bit of an advantage being a part of these playoff games in a way? Like sort of like a, a pre-season. I know you've got the, the two weeks off, but you, you've had that game time, which those other teams in League Two haven't. Yeah, I think it will be an advantage. Um, we've obviously managed to... Um, kind of experience now as well of playing big games without no fans and, and obviously I think the start of the season is going to be very much like that we're starting in September um, so we've kind of got we've got we've got to use that there's, there's always little small advantages that you can always use um, if, if, if that is the case of, of, of having a small advantage on other teams then we'll 100% we'll definitely use it um, but 
like the gaffer said, it's all about, yeah, we'll enjoy this like little period. We've probably have, I know the gaffer's given us two weeks, but I know the lads are already talking about probably only having a week, really. Next week, we'll probably start making sure that we get ourselves back on the road and um, getting out there and getting us fitness levels and making sure we're getting, as you can tell with my voice, all the alcohol out of the system uh, um, and well, that we, we prepared ourselves coming in back in on the 17th and we'll have probably three weeks of, of real intense hard work. We've thrown in some pre-season games again, which will be really good for us. I've been playing as home games at, at Doncaster Rovers, which is fantastic and just kind of get used to them kind of scenarios and, and the feels of, of, of kind of a, a new home for a short base of time for, for a short while. Um, have you? But yeah, if people probably say that we've we've got advantages, yeah, we'll we'll definitely take them as positives and hopefully, like you say, that confidence, that that momentum that we've already got from from getting the two games and, and coming through them really well, um, we'll take into the season and, and we'll hit the ground running. I didn't want to mention your voice, Josh, but uh, but there you go. Uh, Simon, <laughs> I need mean, I, I need mean, I mean, uh, put all my hands up there. Do you know what I mean? I, I, like I just said. I, I did think I'd, I took it quite steady and not enjoyed myself too much, but my voice is telling me absolutely different story. So. Oh, there's no hiding from it. It's no, in trouble. Say, Squeaking out. I mean, yesterday, my little girl wanted to send uh, Josh a, a message because she's um, Bob's his, her favourite player. So she said, I want to send him a vid video message. So I'm there videoing this message to my captain. Then he came back later on in the day and it was like squeaky from... <laughs> Toy Story, and uh, so I just sent him a message saying, "Get a hot drink down, you will, yeah. Sort your throat out." So it's yeah. no better today. <laughs> yeah, so it sounds like you're certainly enjoying it. Um, I'll end with you though, Simon. As a squad, what do you believe that you can achieve th this coming season? Now, is it is it all about staying up, or can can you do even better? Well, I don't do even better, but we came into the National League. Only started last last season, um, so it's our second season. But with the mindset of right, okay, we'll ride the punches. If we get the really nails, we'll pick ourselves up with the same group and go again, and we'll learn because the quick learners and the honest lads who all have got the uh, the pride in themselves to do well for the badge. Um, and we're going with the same mindset, you know that we're not making the numbers up, uh, but with no grand statements, so no massive expectations, burdening the players, and we'll just. Um, play our house out, you know, for the town and, and um, hopefully keep the momentum rolling and see where we end up. Simon, Josh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Good luck in League Two next season. I'm sure you won't need it from me. Um, and, and yeah, enjoy the rest of the celebrations. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. So that's it. The final podcast of a long, long season. Like and subscribe to the show if you've enjoyed it. Thanks for tuning in and bye for now. Bye.